Great. Uh, welcome to the first part of the Linguistic Colloquium. And today we will have uh, Michael Dirks uh, from Pomona College giving a talk. Uh, let me introduce him uh, before he shares his research. Uh, Michael is an Associate Professor of Linguistics and Cognitive Science at Pomona College. And he works mainly in syntactic and morphological theory and uh, of East Africa. Especially he uh, works on the domains of agreement and noun phrase licensing. He has been working on documentation projects as well, and I think uh, today's work also stems from those uh, documentation projects. And his recent work investigates the interface, interface between information structure and syntax, both in Bantu languages and in nilo saharan languages like Kipsigis. Today, uh, uh, Michael will talk about Bukuso object marking at the interface of pragmatics and syntax. And if I'm not mistaken, it's a, a talk uh, prepared together with Justin Sikuku. Yeah, okay, please. All right, let me share my screen here. All right, you see my handout here, which is just the same handout which was sent to you, but you have the PDF so you can scroll around if you would like. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so again, I want to recognize my collaborator in this, um, Justine Sikuku. Uh, we've been working on this for most of our postgrad careers at this point. Um, and we think we've gotten close to figuring it out though, which is nice. So um, he can't be here right now because it's the middle of the night in Kenya. But <clears throat> some basic background here. Object marker constructions, we'll call them OMs or um, object markers uh, are among the most well-researched areas of human language syntax. So investigations of object markers in Bantu languages and in other places have usually centered around whether they can co-occur with or double lexical DP objects under what conditions, how they come to appear in the positions they occur in, and therefore whether these things are pronominal forms, agreement markers, or something else. Um, and so these alternatives usually center on a core diagnostic of whether or not the object marker is in complementary distribution with an overt in situ lexical object. So if you look at one, uh, one A is a basic transitive sentence, I saw Wakesa. <clears throat> one B, the circled morpheme on the verb there, Mu, is the object marker. And this means I saw him. And you'll see here, attempting to include Wakesa here is unacceptable um, in this kind of context. So you can't get some version of I saw Wakesa here, just I saw him. And so the generalizations that we're going to find in a bit of a roadmap here. So a necessary but not sufficient condition of OM doubling is that the little bp be focused, the verb phrase be focused, or contain a focus. Another necessary but not sufficient condition is that the OM doubled phrase itself be discourse given. And a final necessary condition is that focus be interpreted as especially significant or noteworthy given the context. And we're analyzing this as mirrored focus. <clears throat> Our analysis in the end is going to look something like what you see in two. This is a simplified version. Um, but you have phi probes on functional heads, and so there's a focus operator that bears a phi probe that finds the object, and there's also a mirrorative operator that has a phi probe, which um, we're going to say finds the focus operator or the phi features on that head. So you get a feature sharing agree relationship here. So um, just a very simplified view so you can see where things are going. We actually separate out the mirrorative um, piece from the focus and given this piece. So disclaimer, in the interest of giving the full empirical pictures, we understand it. This presentation covers a lot of ground. As a result, it's really not as tightly argued as uh, syntax talk should be. Um, and we have a book about it. If you really want to read about it, uh, I can get you a draft of that soon. Um, our hope is that the payoff of seeing the whole complex empirical picture is worth it, but I'm happy to field questions about the gaps. So moving to section two here. Um, so we have a previous paper about this. Uh, so what we found is that object markers in Bakusu Lama transitives can co-occur with a postverbal object, but that object occurs after a clear and discernible prosodic break and receives an afterthought topic reading. So this is I, it, saw, dog. Um, so there's very a very clear prosodic break for people there, a 
straight up paws. And uh, so it's clearly a right dislocated uh, object in those instances. But there are some exceptions um, to these restrictions. And so um, what we found in that previous paper is in example four here. This is I it ate Ugali. And this means something like I did eat Ugali. So if someone's doubting that this is true or you're in an argument about whether or not the Ugali was eaten, you can say this. So in this previous work, which I'll cite as Sikuku at all, but I, I want here I spelled out everything because I want to be clear that we're all implicated. <laughs> so we um, showed that this co-occurrence is available, but only in pragmatic contexts that license virum or virum focus, similar to English emphatic do, how we translated there for. Um, so in that previous work, we proposed that the doubling object marker and the non-doubling object marker in Bakusu have different syntactic derivations. So non-doubling object markers were just incorporated pronouns. Doubling object markers were agreement morphemes arising on an emphasis head. That head introduced a, a semantic operator, the VRM operator, which created the VRM interpretation. We don't go into too much depth recalling, recalling the previous analysis because this analysis predicts that OM doubling should always require a VRM reading. And what we're gonna see here in 3.1 is we've falsified that first thing in this talk. Um, it turns out OM doubling does not require a VRM-like reading in Papusu. And so here's just one example of, we'll see many. So in five, for example, you have a question, you cook beans how? How did you cook the beans? The answer, I them cooked beans quickly. I cooked the beans quickly is completely illicit. And you don't have a, a reading here like I did cook the beans quickly. You don't need to be arguing with something, someone about this. Um, <clears throat> and so what we find here in 3.2, we summarize, is that focus facilitates OM doubling. I'm using the word facilitates here intentionally because I don't mean licenses doubling because it's not sufficient for doubling, but it definitely facilitates doubling. So it makes it sound much better when there's focus, um, clearly focused elements there. So, um, <clears throat> then, so when some element in the verb phrase is focused, OM doubling is relatively natural. So in six, when a temporal adjunct is questioned or bears new information focus, OM doubling is listed without fear. And so here in the question, children, it harvested maize when? When did the children harvest the maize? Here, it's possible to have doubling there without a Viram-like interpretation. And in the answer to that question, down on page three, the children, it harvested maize yesterday. The children harvested the maize yesterday. This answer is also acceptable with Viram without, or sorry, acceptable with doubling without a Viram reading. Um, same thing if you use a focus particle. So in seven, OM doubling is facilitated if you put focus on the constituent in the verb phrase using ongene only. So here, the children them brought parents only water, water only. Um, the parents brought, the, sorry, the children brought their parents only water. This is okay, again, without this virum interpretation that we noted in that previous work. Um, so having focused phrases definitely facilitates doubling without that theorem interpretation. Um, key though, those focused phrases must be internal to the verb phrase to facilitate doubling. Um, so for example, only in situ questions facilitate doubling. So if we have the question um, 8A and B are two versions of the same question, 8A is WH in situ, 8B is WH X situ. And so we can see only the in situ question licenses doubling without a VRM interpretation. So in AA, children, it harvested maize when? It's possible to have doubling here without this VRM like interpretation. But if you uh, move the focus phrase Lina to the left edge here, so we have X situ WH phrase, when was it that the children, it harvested maize? This is not acceptable without a Viram-like interpretation. So you have to be having an argument about something in order to say a sentence like that. Um, similarly, we see in nine, Bakusu allows canonical word order in Bakusu, which you've seen here, subject, verb, object. But uh, post-verbal subjects are possible for focused subjects. So this gives us another way to investigate this. So in 9a, we see a pre-verbal subject with ongene only focus. Only the children brought their parents water. Here, OM doubling is unacceptable without a VRM reading. Um, but if you leave the, uh, the subject in situ down here, 
only Wakesa et Ugali. So it says it et Ugali Wakesa only. Um, here, OM doubling is just fine um, without a virum like interpretation. There is particular interpretation of all of these doubling sentences, which we'll get to, but uh, it doesn't necessitate that kind of virum like we're in an argument. Um, now, we did see above virum like readings do license it. And this is interesting because properties of the verb phrase as a whole do facilitate OM doubling. So it doesn't have to be just the sub constituent inside the VP. Um, and so one example of this are the virum readings. So in 10, the context is, I told you that I saw the students, but you doubt me, saying you don't believe that I did. I can respond, I them saw students, meaning, meaning I did see the students. Let's stop talking about this. Um, but there are many additional instances of focus or emphasis on the predicate as opposed to some subconstituent of the verb phrase facilitating OM doubling. So this is just one example here in 11. Um, the children it ate Ugali, they didn't chase the chickens. So here you're contrasting um, two uh, verb phrases and here OM doubling sounds quite natural without like a virum like reading um, that we we're seeing before. So quick summary. Um, and these were all just illustrations of the patterns, not arguments for the patterns. But um, so an intermediate summary, focus definitely facilitates OM doubling. So focus on any verb phrase level constituent facilitates Focused elements that facilitate facilitate double, sorry, focused elements that facilitate doubling include focus on the entire predicate, focus on any object argument, can be theme, causi, benefactive, instrumentative, locative, um, focused in situ subjects, and also focus on low manner ad, or sorry, low adverbials like manner or temporal adverbials. This excludes, so focus on high adverbials does not license doubling. Non-argument locatives does not license doubling. Preverbal subjects, a bar extracted elements. Um, so it needs to be a focused element inside the verb phrase. All right, so an initial analysis here, which would be part of the story. Um, so standard assumptions about the Bantu, about Bantu sentence structure, and this is true for Bakusu as well, um, is that agent subjects are in spec TP. Um, you've got subject marker and tense coming in on T. Object markers are tend to be assumed to be entering in a, kind of a what you see is what you get instance here, like in the middle field of the inflectional domain. Um, verbs are assumed to move to a low inflectional head, often mood or aspect people assume. Um, and we often get objects in situ down there. Um, and so this matches the Bakusu facts pretty well. We're not gonna show verb movement ever just to, um, make our drawings more clear when we have them. So, um, so referencing the notion of topic comment configurations more generally, we're going to use the term comment domain pre-theoretically to describe the focus domain of a clause. Um, and so we're going to use a comment P to capture these focal effects. We intentionally don't use a more familiar focus phrase because as you'll see, the structural effects of the focus operator are distinct from what people assume for focus phrase normally, which means the focus thing is in your specifier normally, um, and that's not what we're saying. So we call this thing a common phrase. Um, so in many Southern Bantu languages, this domain exists in all constructions. So little VP is obligatorily a focus domain um, in Zulu and a lot of other languages. Um, and so, for example, despite canonical SVO word order, focus subjects obligatorily appear post-verbally in Zulu and a bunch of other Southern Bantu languages also. Um, we tend to only see these effects appearing in OM doubling constructions in Makusu, not generally across all cases, but um, so little VP ends up being a focal domain. We're saying there is a comment head heading a comment phrase at the edge of little VP. Um, but there's still questions here. <laughs> like, um, so we're demarcating a focus domain, but what does one thing have to do with the other? So why does OM doubling an object create an emphatic reading often on something else inside the verb phrase? It's not at all obvious what's going on there. Um, and so very briefly introducing some formal approaches to focus. Um, we're not gonna be very formal about it, but um, so Ruth's theory of focus, and this, this image is adapted from um, a more recent summary from Buring, but, um, so the argument is that there's a semantic operator called squiggle. And what squiggle does is make presuppositions about its complement and about um, the focus licensing of elements in its complement. 
And so an informal, informal but hopefully sufficient to understand what's going on here. Um, explanation of 15. So a focused element, which is marked with, oh, I changed this, with a folk feature here, um, requires a focused antecedent in the discourse context. Per standard assumptions, focused elements introduce a set of alternatives. So an appropriate focus antecedent is among this, that set of alternatives. The variable C up here represents the focus antecedent. So this is bringing in an antecedent from the discourse, referring to something that's among the set of alternatives. And we'll look at an example here. Um, and so the squiggle operator introduces the presupposition that some element in here, so here it's A, has a focus antecedent in the context, which is provided by C. Um, and so to look at the mini discourse here in 16. Um, so we have a focused phrase here in 16B. Messi is the greatest footballer of all time. So in English, the way this is communicated is with a nuclear pitch accent on Messi. Messi. So we put it in small caps so you can hear me saying it louder. Um, so the sentence in 16B I cannot just walk up to someone out of the blue and say, Messi is the greatest footballer of all time. Um, what this requires is uh, in order for this to be listed, there is a set of alternatives. X is the greatest footballer of all time. And the context must include one of those alternatives. So a very natural one here in 16A, someone says Ronaldo is the greatest footballer of all time. That is a member of the set, X is the greatest footballer of all time. So it is a viable focus uh, antecedent for 16B. So when someone says 16A, Ronaldo is the greatest footballer of all time, you can say, no, Messi is the greatest footballer of all time. And then that is completely felicitous. Um, and so the idea is the squiggle operator, what it does, introduces the presupposition that um, these things have focus, there is something that requires a focus antecedent and the, um, variable C is giving you um, into your compositional semantics the focus antecedent from somewhere in the discourse. Um, anyway, why that matters is it's actually going to be central to how we end up analyzing this. So an initial analysis here, initial analysis, it's going to shift. Um, ComHead and ComNP introduces both the five features that serve to generate OM doubling, but also the focus operator that presupposes an appropriately focused constituent in its complement. That focus may be on the entire VP or on a sub-constituent. And so this, I mean, per standard assumptions, this operator simply needs something in its complement that is focused. And so that can be the entire complement or that can be some element inside the complement. Um, generating the object marker, at least as far as we've gotten here, we have a phi probe on this head, which finds the object. So pretty standard assumption. So an illustration here, when did the children see their teacher? Um, in the answer, the children OM saw teacher yesterday. And so this is giving you some kind of emphasis on yesterday. In this context, yesterday has that focus feature. Um, it's appropriately licensed here because um, here the context right provides an appropriate antecedent. A question gives the appropriate antecedent for that focus. Um, but the com head bears phi feature, probes its C command domain, finds, a T, finds the DP object right there. So really simple, straightforward agree relation on a head that simply brings in an operator that has to do with focus. Um, a couple of things you'll notice. Um, you may have noticed that the lower position of the subject in spectral VP is conveniently ignored. Um, so there's a counter cyclic component here. These operations will care about surface positions and not underlying positions. Um, we have some comments about it in the appendix. That's a whole other thing. Um, but <laughs> we'll, we can talk about it later if you want to. But, um, all right, another illustration here, um, which also is, is kind of a quite unfamiliar sort of thing if you come from studying clinic doubling in general. If a lone object of a monotransitive is in a context where a sub-constituent of that DP is focused, the entire DP can be OM doubled without a virum like reading of the clause. And so we can see this in 20. Person A says, Wafula et Ugali. Person B says, Yeah, I agree, but Wafula OM et Ugali much. So this is, Buren calls this an elaboration focus. So you're adding additional information that wasn't solicited. And so here the focus is on the interpretation is here that there was a lot of Ugali. So person B is emphasizing just how much Ugali there was. 
Um, and so this is a, a perfectly natural circumstance for licensing OM doubling. Um, so the degree modifier is the focus marked element here. Um, and so this satisfies the presuppositions on COM. So again, you have this focus operator, which wants a focus thing in its complement. Um, here, the focus thing is a sub-constituent of the DP, but that's fine by the semantics of focus. Um, and in the same way, our five features are on the COM head. Probe, find the DP goal, which has class 14 five features, and that gets you your own doubling construction up there. Um, so by now, at this point, we're simply positing that the same head that does focus stuff is carrying five features that finds a goal. Um, and so that's how you uh, end up in these configurations. But um, there's additional layers of interpretive constraints. So let's get these handled. Um, section five here, OM doubled objects must be interpreted as discourse given. And this is actually a familiar pattern cross linguistically for clinic doubling operations. Um, very selected evidence here. Um, so in 5.1.1, OM doubling constructions are degraded with a non specific object. Um, and so uh, that, that was a poorly named section header there. <laughs> um, I'll just describe 22 to you. Um, so what we see in 22, you have I gave a child milk. This is a, a standard ditrans differ. Um, assuming appropriate focus conditions are met, and it could be any range of focus conditions, I don't want to pay attention to that right now, but 22B, where you have OM doubling on child. Importantly, this means that I gave a specific child milk. It's known who the child is. Um, so this just can't mean I gave some child milk, but I don't know who they are. It's a specific identifiable child. Um, again, that's a common pattern with um, these kind of things cross linguistically. Here's another example here. So if we say the child fed only those cows maize, so we're putting focus on um, the, in this case, it's the, the uh, cause object, <laughs> um, but the structurally higher object here. So these cows only. Um, the key here, which we're annotating with this um, question mark here, where it is, less natural to omit the demonstrative here. Um, you have to be talking about discourse familiar cows. Now, um, Bakusu, like all Bantu languages, doesn't require determiners or demonstratives. And so you can actually leave that out and still be talking about discourse familiar cows. But it sounds much more natural when the demonstrative calls that out, the fact that you have to be talking about identifiable cows. Um, and so, here, the doubled object is focused, but it's also um, discourse given, so they're identifiable. Um, another example of this is that WH phrases may themselves be OM doubled, um, but they have to be delinked. So 24A, Watulo saw who? If you try to put the object marker in this construction, it, it's really straight ungrammatical, really sounds bad. Um, but if I say which teacher did what Watulo see? Watulo, Watulo, OM saw teacher what? Which teacher did Watulo see? Here, own doubling sounds very natural. Um, and again, delinking again is calling out some specific um, set, uh, identi discourse identifiable set. Um, so what it looks like, and this is just a, a, a bit of the evidence, there's more, um, is that OM doubled objects have to be discourse given. Um, and so the beginning of the givenness analysis here, um, we're going to assume syntactic discourse features. And so assuming with Kratzer and Selkirk 2020, discourse features are represented syntactically. So probes may be specified for both or either G, meaning given, or folk, meaning um, bearing a contrast. So this is your focus feature. The squiggle operator bears a focus feature that is a probe. And this is, again, following Kratzer and Selkirk. Um, and that probe finds a folk market element in its C command domain. Um, we're, we're not going to formalize the agree relation more until later in the presentation. Um, so we're going to be slightly informal about this. Um, if you're not a generative syntactician, it is maybe absurd to call this informal. But <laughs> it's not quite fully formalized yet. Um, 
And so our assumptions here are second approximation. The COM head introduces five features that generate OM doubling and the focus operator that presupposes a focus constituent in its COM. So this is the same as before. The focus may be on the entire VP, again, like before, or it may be on a subconstituent. Um, here, what we're adding here, agreement with COM, that is a misstatement, sorry, that survived from an earlier version of the handout, requires a discourse given goal, is what I want to say there requires a discourse given goal. Um, and so the folk probe, so now instead of just saying there's presuppositions, we're actually saying there is a probe, a folk feature that will probe and find something that is folk marked in its complement. Um, and so this is what I actually mean to say, the five probe appears to be linked with the givenness requirement. And we informally represent that here by just saying, hey, there's a G there, which we'll get more specific about. All right, hopefully you're still with me. <laughs> We're going well. We're on to the last necessary component of an OM doubling construction. And this is that Bakusu OM doubling creates a mirative focus reading. Um, and we'll talk about what mirative focus is. Um, so before we've seen VP must be focused or contain a focus, the OM doubled phrase itself must be discourse given. The final piece, the focus must be interpreted as especially significant, noteworthy, or surprising in the context. And so Delancey in 1997, 2001, established the concept of mirativity, um, which he defined as conveying information which is new or unexpected to the speaker. Um, surprising is a frequently used description for a mirative context. It's notably not the only um, context that counts as mirative, but um, I, well, I don't know how in detail we'll be able to get to that. But um, so to this point, every instance of OM doubling that we've seen has been optional. So what's the interpretive difference between an OM doubled sentence and a sentence without the OM? So just a minimal comparison here. This is the same example we've seen before. When did the teachers, sorry, when did the children see their teacher? In the answer, we have an undoubled sentence. The children saw their teacher yesterday. Um, and we have a doubled sentence. The children saw their teacher yesterday. There are interpretive differences between 27A here, undoubled, and 27B being doubled. Um, and the, the answer in 27B, there's an additional interpretive component uh, that it's the fact that this, like the fact that this happened yesterday in particular is especially significant as opposed to some other time. So an example context here, the children have been waiting a long time to see their teacher and it finally happened yesterday, um, something like that. What we find is this ends up being quite general. So OM doubling is licensed by noteworthy and or unexpected events. So recall that OM doubling an object in a simple monotransitive is generally unacceptable without a VRM reading. So this is why we don't get Wafula object marker eight Ugali this without additional context that is influenced this. Um, but if a context can be constructed such that the reported event is particularly noteworthy or intense, OM doubling is acceptable. And so the same exact sentence we're going to talk about here, the context, Waful is lying on the couch, clearly bloated with a bulging belly. Maybe he's like opened up his pants so he can feel more comfortable. He's napping, but he's uncomfortable. On seeing this scene, someone could ask, what's going on with him? And it could be answered, Wafula, object marker, eight Ugali. It's the same exact sentence we were seeing about. And this is fine. Um, and it means something like Wafula really ate Ugali, which is this complex sense of, he shouldn't have eaten because look what it's gotten him. Here it is, but here we are. Um, so it's this very nuanced, emphatic reading here. Um, but you see here, there's all kinds of ways to construct surprising, noteworthy events. So if the predicate itself is surprising enough in the context of a sentence, OM doubling is natural enough without additional discourse specific knowledge. So here, this is just general background info. Ugali is a hugely culturally important food in Western Kenya. So for most, for most people, they don't consider themselves to have eaten in a day if they haven't eaten Ugali. Um, so the sentence below says that someone threw out Ugali, which is just on, its, on the face of it, a very surprising act. So you can just say, Bafula OM threw out Ugali. You don't need additional discourse context or anything. I mean, you have the cultural context, which matters here that like, that's not supposed to happen. Um, and so this means that this is especially surprising. Um, similarly, familiarity can, I'll say, unlicense OM doubling. 
Um, so illicit OM doubling context like 30 can be undone if a specific discourse context can make uh, that to be predictable or expected. So here, um, again, a complex <laughs> sentence though, but the context, sorry, complex context. Shouldn't say those two words together. Um, Wafula and his wife are visiting their California friends and they're consistently making them Kenyan food in an effort to acculturate them to Kenyan things. But the American friends are not developing a taste for ugali and they keep failing to eat it. So on an almost daily basis, Wafula is throwing out uneaten ugali. And in this context, Wafula's wife could say in a resigned and disappointed manner, Wafula threw out the ugali again. Here, it would not be felicitous to include the object marker because this is expected because this in this specific context, this has been happening daily. Um, and so here it would sound strange to say that because neither Wafula or his wife are surprised at this. Um, and so by making something familiar or unnoteworthy, you can reduce the acceptability of OM doubling. Um, so a quick relevant parallel here um, from romance mirative fronting. Um, so various romance languages and other Indo-European languages too have a type of focus fronting um, that people have called mirative fronting. And there's a range of work on this. Um, so this fronting conveys that the information being offered is unexpected or surprising. And that emphatic reading is marked with italics in the examples below. So in 32, the context is Lucy is telling news about her brother, oh, sorry, her friend's new boyfriend. Um, you can say a ring of diamonds to her has given. He gave her a diamond ring. And so this means this is surprising and noteworthy. Um, and some notes here. So in a, a, a series of work, um, these folks have analyzed mere fronting as a focused dependent conventional implicature. So it's a conventional implicature, but it's focus dependent. And so a speaker commits themselves to the content of the implicature. It's not a conversational implicature. It's actually a part of the grammar, but um, nonetheless, the emphatic interpretation is separable from the propositional content. So the prop propositional content, meaning the true or falseness of it. So the propositional content, for example, can be denied while accepting the mirative content, or the mirative content can be denied while accepting the propositional content. This shows that these are, are two different dimensions of meaning. Um, and so Bakusu shares these properties. So these diagnostics are borrowed from them. So the speaker is committed to the mirative content. It can't be canceled. So if, you, if we have an OM doubling sentence, the children saw the teacher yesterday, it's significant that it was yesterday. You can't then say, but that's not news or but that doesn't surprise me. This would be contradictory to say this. I, so the speaker is committed to that mirative content. It's not, this is different than a, than a conversational inflictor. Um, but the mirative content is separate from the propositional content. So the mirative content can be denied by the addressee distinct from the propositional content. So here we have the same sentence, the children saw the teacher yesterday. It's significant that it was yesterday. Um, but someone can follow up and say, but that's not news. She comes that day every week. So here they're denying the surprise reading, but they're not denying that she came yesterday. So you're accepting the propositional content, but denying the surprise reading, the mirative reading. Um, and same thing, that's just an, another version of that. Um, you can deny the mirative without denying the propositional content and the other way around. So you can deny the propositional content distinct from the mirative content. So again, we, we kept the sentence the same here, so we don't have to look at too many different kinds of sentences. But um, the children, OM saw a teacher yesterday. The children saw the teacher yesterday. It's significant that it was yesterday. Um, person B can say, that can't possibly be true. She's not in the country. So person B is matching the emotional intensity they're saying they're saying that would be surprising if it was true but they're denying the fact that it's true so you're accepting implicitly at least the mirrorative content but denying the propositional content so the point being these are both kinds of meaning that come from the sentence that a speaker is commit, committed to but uh they're different sorts of meaning and so the analysis that this uh, whole research team i think um has put forward for the, the romance and Indo-European fronting um, is that this is a conventional implicature. And so they define the mirative implicature as a conventional implicature that this proposition that's being reported is less likely than other focus alternative propositions. Um, 
So we're going to set aside the formal analysis. They, they do have a formal analysis, but setting it aside. They argue, though, that miratives are focus-associated conventional implicatures. So you need to reference the alternative possibilities that focus brings in in its denotation, but note that the one that's being reported was less likely than the others, um, or at least less likely than some of the others. Um, and so they called this the focus implicature. Um, so this is distinct from focus, but depends on focus. Um, and so this is um, shortcutting <laughs> what, but this is uh, their kind of schematic that you have a focus domain that has a focus operator there. Um, and outside the focus operator, you have the mirative operator, which brings in the mirative interpretation. Um, but crucially is dependent on the existence of focus inside there. And so at this point, you can probably see where this is going. We basically adopt directly their structure there in 37, um, where our com head is again doing our focus and given this thing, right? We had this before. So the com head has a folk feature that's probing for, um, or sorry, a focus probe that's probing for folk features. And then you have the com head also has a phi probe. But the mirative uh, probe, or sorry, there's a mirative projection that carries the mirative conventional implicature, or sorry, the mirative operator that denotes the implicature. That also is a phi probe, and that is the probe that is going to ultimately spell out the object marker. Um, and that finds the features that are on COM from COM's probing. And so, I was hoping, hoping I would get to show you section seven, but we may need to do it in Q&A or later if, if you're curious. But let me show you at least some initial evidence for why um, we find it intriguing to separate, to have the object marker be actually the realization of the mirrored head um, and separated from the com head, because there are some instances where those can be disentangled. In Bakusu, um, We've really only found one. We've found others in other languages. But um, so this is a whole sentence mirrored focus. So we have encountered one situation that is exempt from the givenness requirement on OM doubled objects. So this exception uh, occurs with a crucial interpretive distinction. So the entire event or situation has to be interpreted as noteworthy. There's a, a distinctive interpre in, interpretation here. And so Let's give you a context here in a sentence. In Bakusu culture, a young man should not marry a, a widow, at least traditionally. So if this is to happen, it's considered highly scandalous. So in the situation being considered, the father has gone away for some time and returns only to have his wife inform him that their 19-year-old son, Wafula, has married an older widow. In this instance, the wife can report to her husband, Wafula, object marker, married a widow. Crucially here, this is not reference to a specific widow or any aforementioned widow. This is just simply the act of marrying a widow is scandalous and that's all that needs to be said. Um, so we found a collection of these where it is possible to own double a non-specific, non-given object, but every single time it has this whole sentence focus reading which feels very distinct from the other kinds of readings that we got. And so in this instance, what we're saying is this is an instance of OM doubling with a mirative implicature, a mirative head, it's whole sentence focus. So there is still focus um, that's involved, but the focus is marking the whole sentence here. There is no calm head here. So there's no calm head marking a lower focus domain. That means there's also no com head intermediating between the mirative head and uh, the OM doubled object, which means it's only in these instances that you can have non-specific doubled objects. So, um, so you you may notice there's <laughs> the, the mirative operator is now far away from the focus operator. So. Uh, a standard assumption about conventional implicatures is that conventional implicatures are always passed up to the root. Um, so this is because conventional impl implicatures apply to the propositional, uh, the, the compositional semantics and not the other way around. And so um, we're assuming it could compose appropriately that way. But 
So there's some really interesting stuff about symmetrical and asymmetrical doubling, which I is complicated. And so <laughs> I um, can stick around a little bit and talk about that if people have time and want to. But let me just summarize quickly um, what we're finding here. So Bakusu ohm doubling is intricately tied to the properties of givenness and focus, but it's also tied to a particular emphatic interpretation that we've identified as mirrored in focus. Um, so in an ohm doubling construction, some XP must bear mirrored of focus surface VP internally, um, unless the entire clause bears mirrored of focus. Um, and the ohm double DP may, may bear the mirrored of focus if the pragmatic syntactic and semantic conditions are correct, but it doesn't necessarily need to do so. Um, and our argument is actually uh, that those so-called VRM focus readings that we are, were identified earlier um, is actually a subtype of mirative focus. Cross-linguistically, people have noted that mirative constructions can have a use that some people have called like a reprimand reading, um, where I don't find the thing being said noteworthy or surprising, but you do, and you shouldn't, <laughs> because it's true. And so where mirativity takes into account not just the mental states of the speaker, but also the mental states of the audience. Um, and that can therefore be used in context that English theorem focus can be used in. This is our current line of thinking about that. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so thank you. Complicated construction, lots of interesting stuff going on. Uh, very happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the, let me clap. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for uh, the interesting talk. And now we have some uh, question and answers. Uh, of course, you can also uh, tell us more about uh, <laughs> seven, but, uh, uh, section seven. But first, uh, do we have any comments, questions? Or... Yes, Laura. Uh -huh. Yeah, gosh, thanks for this is a fascinating talk. Uh, hi. Um, wow. Yeah, so I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, so first let me say, I mean, what's really interesting about this of, yeah, for us Bantuists is that it's common for the object marker to be used <clears throat> to agree with an out of focus object, I guess you could say a given object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but what's less, what's surprising in this data um, for me is that the out of focus object or the given object is seems to be in its in situ position. Yeah, and so one of my questions is, does, do you have, um, yeah, I know you've been focusing in your recent work on these, um, on these on this data because it's so surprising but I wonder do you find the less surprising kind of data in Bukusu? do you find um, object markers on verbs you know agreeing with dislocated objects or or is it just in this context yes yeah, so you you do find them in <laughs> so currently I think there's probably two kinds of right dislocations. I think there's the relatively low right dislocations that I think a lot of you have talked about for, for these, like, for, um, you wrote on, it was Zulu with, with uh, Lisa, Yeah, right? with Lisa. Yeah. yeah, and I was gonna say that she said that no one has a formal analysis of VP being the domain of focus, but Lisa and I have written at least two papers I, hey, maybe it's not the kind of formal analysis you're interested in, but we do have a formal analysis. No, and yeah, I, I, don't so, mean, I don't mean to say at all that there's an analysis of that, but I, I meant formal in the sense of formal semantic formal. Um, and the, the reason why oh, that- Yeah, matters, yeah, for sure, yeah. The reason why that matters is because <laughs> we need the formalisms to, to capture this range of things, but in Bakusu at least. But to your question, is, which is a good one. So Bakusu does allow right dislocations with an uh, object mark, like, like call it clinic doubling right dislocation or something, but it is, so not the kind of like prosodic distinction that you all are finding where it's like, I'll call it 
nuanced, identifiable, but nuanced. Like for Bokusu speakers, it's like, you have to stop talking <laughs> and then say the object. It's, it's, it's very um, disconnected from the rest of the clause, which is different from what I've seen in other languages where yeah. like, you, you don't have to stop talking. Like the prosodic boundary will be marked in some way, but it, it's not that same kind of thing. And it's, it's very interesting. We've spent a lot of time trying to demonstrate or not just demonstrate, but find out, is this doubled object in situ or not in situ? Because it, it wasn't obvious to us what was true. And so you don't it, get objects in pre-verbal position because I you well, you can do that also, but it, it, those are like clear dislocations that are so you get both of those, the, the kind of typical left dislocation and right dislocation. But what I think what I think you don't get are the kind of short movements that like you and Lisa talked about, that Jochen talked about, that other people have talked about, um, where it the object looks like it's moving out of the verb phrase, but isn't behaving as if it's like really structurally high. It's behaving like it's it's relatively closely related to the verb phrase. Um, and yeah, though I guess, yeah, for Zulu, the most important. Well, okay, I'm not the syntax brains in our in yeah. our collaboration, so Lisa might have something totally different to say. But as a phonologist, half of this collaboration it seemed like the most important thing was to get the um, non-focused elements outside the little VP and how far up they went yeah. could actually be hard to determine. I guess in some cases we had arguments, and in other cases. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't. So we've had a really hard time diagnosing the edge of VP because yeah. almost, every, so we don't have conjoint disjoint distinctions here. Um, the, the tonal evidence is at the very least not straightforward. We're still, there, like there's an idea that maybe melodic high deletion occurs specifically in conjoint context and not disjoint context, but like that, that is a complex set of facts that we have. It's just like possibly a fact. So like in the, the book that Siku and I have worked on, we, we have a variety of indirect arguments because there's scrambling of arguments to the left edge of the verb phrase. Um, so especially like if you identify an aboutness topic, that has to be immediately after the verb, arguably at the left edge of the verb phrase. Oh, and there's and, and there's, about what's a topic has to be immediately after the yes. verb. Wow. Now, focused things can go there too, but about this topics have to go there. So it it wow. is an IAB position, but it's not IAB focus, at least in the in the way traditionally talked about. But so we we just call it a prominence position because we didn't know what to call it um, but so but that looks like it's the left edge of the verb phrase but it's under common the common head because it participates in all of this stuff and then it looks like we borrowed a diagnostic from the zulu work um, that vocatives behave as if they might demarcate the right edge of the verb phrase and so if you construct a context that has a scrambled non uh, an aboutness topic for a, like a, a locative about this topic to demarcate the left edge and evocative and your own doubling, which you can do. Anyway, it it looks like it looks like every other time, which is it just looks like it's in C2. <laughs> um, and so we do a lot of this indirect argumentation to because my assumption was it was moving somewhere, <laughs> but it, it really looks like it's not as far as we can tell, um, as far as Bukusu and maybe even the other Luya behaving like that, which is a big difference from a lot of other languages, which do behave like you're moving that object out of that focal domain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is really interesting. It's so different from the languages that I know that I'm just thinking to wrap my head around it. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. I see there are other questions. So. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Uh, uh, next, uh, yes, Yoshida Sensei. Yeah. I am Tomo Yoshida uh, from ICU. Um, I, I was actually feeling a similar, uh, similarly, uh, Japanese has a right to dislocation. And uh, I, I thought, wow, this is very similar to uh, Japanese right dislocation phenomena. And, and uh, prosodically, uh, Japanese right dislocation can make a distinction, prosodic distinction, like a stop and then 
start again. Yeah. Or some people don't have to do that. It's just the same effect. And then to make it clear, the uh, Japanese linguists are putting the sentence final particle. So uh, uh, Japanese is a strictly head final uh, language, SOB. So the V ends the sentence, and then you put this particle at the end of the sentence, then people know with or without a prosodic uh, distinction. Just yeah. so people automatically know, oh, okay, right, this location. And then, of course, it's like uh, afterthoughts or focus yeah. or, or uh, what you discussed, probably very, very similar. And then the WH phrase can't do that. Yeah. Very similar. And um, so uh, I, I was thinking uh, that um, um, well, you already answered actually. I did personally, you, you, you have a hard time making a uh, distinction between the sentences over and then the right dislocated element starts. Uh, so uh, I, I, th that was something I was curious about. Um, well, anyway, so, so it might be worth looking at um, literature on uh, Japanese right dislocation and then also doubling in a sense. Uh, that that the overt movement appears in Japanese. It's not a agreement marker because Japanese doesn't really have yeah. that kind of stuff, yeah. obviously. So uh, you can you can repeat a word. Um, really, so like uh, I read, um, I don't know Chomsky's paper. Chomsky's paper, <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then if you do that. Well, and then, of course, it's a it's a pro drop language. So uh, mm -hmm. I read sentence ends, and then Chomsky's paper. That's okay too. So so doubling in the sense of overt dub doubling in, with a lexical item uh, is okay. You don't have to do that. But if you ever do that, it's only uh, emphasis, focus, and can't you hear that? Or you know, yeah. it is surprising that yeah. that. that you know, me reading Chomsky's paper kind of uh, uh, uh -huh. implication. So it's just, there's something similar about it. This is this is very interesting to me because um, I have observed doubling, not in the clearly doubling sense, but in the sense that you're saying, just like saying again mm -hmm. <laughs> something that you previously said. This occurring in different contexts. And previously it was the Biram interpretation that kept coming up because people <laughs> across languages and communities, people always seem to be like, you would say this when someone's doubting you. Like this is like what they kind of like, it must be like the, the, I don't know if it's like the most common time they say these or, or they stand out the most because arguments are emotionally <laughs> stressful or something. But um, I like, it's, this is very interesting because it has me thinking about like, is this, actually just an actual more general pattern about saying the same thing twice. Um, where saying the yeah. same thing twice is the mirative construction. Um, and so, although that, that this now, this will then trouble me with some of the, with some of the symmetry facts we didn't get to, but um, yeah, it's, I would, I, I would love if you could send me some papers or references about that because I was literally this morning was was working with a speaker who was who who decided to just keep repeating things. He was like, "Yeah, you're really, really, really surprised." And I was like, "What is going on?" Um, so what you're describing is, I think, a similar pattern exists, and this might be a subtype of 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 that. Yeah. 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 Uh, the doubling uh, could occur with multiple elements. So uh, the right dislocated uh, multiple elements. And then, of course, the copies are all, all remain in the original sentence. Uh, uh, that's possible too. And then uh, switching the word order uh -huh. of the right dislocated elements, uh, possible in some cases and not possible in some other cases, largely because of the emphasis or uh, prosodic pattern. So you have to double up and then kind of uh, uh, by foot structure is allowed, but not others, or, or something yeah. like that. It's, it's it's really amazing interaction with the prosodic structure, and then also semantics and pragmatics, and so again, it's it's Japanese right dislocation seems to be 
share, well, it seems to share some uh, aspects yeah. of this whole phenomenon. No, I, I would really love to see some literature on that because I think, <laughs> as I don't know when I'll have time to do this, but I'm curious to, like, I've never heard someone say to me what you just said, which, like, I've seen, like, I've had so many uh, speakers of Bantu languages explain this to me, both like linguists and not, like, like predicate cleft constructions for a lot of people. So like, it's running that John ran or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, like result in doubling a lot of people report like, um, well, back then it was like a Viram like reading of instances like that. And um, the, yeah, there's, there's just other ones. It, it, it has me thinking there may be something broader that is being missed by, by, by just, you know, like <laughs> only analyzing <laughs> the, the object marker doubling as if, it, as if it's only that small. But um, I'm ecstatic to hear what you're describing to me and would really love to get some, some reading. Yeah, on yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to know that uh, uh, un seemingly un unrelated uh, languages sharing uh, the, a lot of uh, things uh, and um, um, sort of implying there's some, some kind of uni universal uh, aspect to it. So uh, yeah, I, I, I will send you um, a reference. Yeah, yeah, please do. Um, I never would have found out about that before <laughs> you telling me. <laughs> This is uh, this is great. Uh, like so, maybe we will have uh, in few years down the road Bantu Japanese connection kind of yeah. book. <laughs> there was a Bantu romance connection, I think, yeah. at some point when uh, people were working. So um, uh, I think we can uh, continue some discussion after formally just ending and then uh, stopping the video. Uh, so let me just say something for the uh, uh, and. Uh, let me thank uh, the two co-organizers, uh, Professor Tomoyuki Yoshita and Professor uh, Yoko Mista, and the assistant Paris Fleming, as well as the Liaison IERS Institute Assistant Missionary Suzuki. Uh, this event was supported by shared budget of ICU Research Institute, Institute for Educational Research Service, and the Linguist Lab at ICU. Uh, the next part of this series uh, will be held on November 13th. Jason Kandibovich from uh, City University of New York and Mark Baker from Rutgers uh, will uh, uh, share uh, their research on that day. Uh, 